All right. Uh, hello, everybody, once again. And uh, I hope you see my screen now. Let me just put a little bit. Okay. So uh, I start my presentation with uh, once again uh, uh, asking you to download the Docker container by uh, this link. Uh, now the Docker container contains uh, root, junt, and it's many gigabytes. So it takes some time to download. If you don't have Docker installed, uh, there is a, a site with our instructions how one can install Docker. It's pretty good. And let's start the tutorial. You actually will have time to download it. And even if you download it during the tutorial, you will. Uh, you should be easy to actually catch up up until the second part. Okay, let's start the tutorial. So uh, I have one more slide motivating you uh, to download uh, this Docker container. And yes, if you downloaded yesterday, please run this command. You will have an update of the image. The update is pretty small, but still uh, you want to have uh, the same tutorials I do. Uh, so what's going to be during this tutorial? So first I will introduce uh, our software and uh, what's exactly there and uh, give you a little bit more time to download Docker if you haven't done so yet. And then we have a first part of this hands-on tutorial where we will actually run the simulation. So I show how to run our simulation package, how to process uh, the, what are the outputs, how to process the outputs, and we'll build some plots and even run some uh, reconstruction software with our simulation package. And then we'll proceed to the second part of the, our tutorial where we will go inside uh, and uh, integrate. Finally, we will integrate Yaroslav detector in G4E, but also I will show how you create uh, your detector and uh, some internals of our package. And after this, I will have a final round with presentations where I will try to answer most common questions and there will be a good time actually for your questions. Uh, and then uh, probably it's gonna be the end. Hopefully it's gonna be before, uh, like 15 minutes before 11 or something like this. So you will have a slight time to have a break before the second part of our tutorials. It's fun for all. Okay, uh, let's proceed. Uh, let's actually proceed with what software we have for this Docker image and what's happening. So here's the most simple and simplistic uh, diagram of the simulation software stack. Uh, on top we have a Monte Carlo generators and on the bottom we have a reconstruction and analysis. And this uh, arrow on the left actually shows that sometimes you just want to process uh, the outputs of the generator, analyze it, and that's everything you want. But then you certainly need some kind of fast detector simulations or smearing, and finally a full detector simulation. So as you can guess, uh, this tutorial uh, centers on this part. And uh, to address these questions, here is the software that we have in our container. So for Monte Carlo, we have uh, several sample files, uh, like from Pifia, Beagle, and Herbic. And uh, for full simulation, we are going to use a package called G4E, stands for Junt for EIC. I will uh, in detail explain what is the software. Uh, we had the uh, previous a meeting on uh, previous tutorials on fast simulations, actually with EIC smear. And we are going to use uh, Ijana, well, very briefly, but anyway, Ijana reconstruction framework uh, and analysis in these tutorials. So uh, G4E stands for Junt4 EIC, I already told it. It's standalone C++ Junt4 application. So uh, if you're familiar with Junt4, uh, examples, extended examples, that if you are Junt4 uh, expert, it should be easy for you to navigate inside this G4E. It can open uh, various common for EIC Monte Carlo files like HEPMC, PFA, Herbic, uh, Beagle, and others. Uh, it also has an integration with importing uh, accelerator elements, so now it has two beamlines, JLake and Herbic. 
And uh, it has some internal infrastructure, so it's easier for you to import three detectors uh, and geometry elements and do some sort of operations that you need to do for this yellow reports uh, detector studies. So here's the, if you would like to go to its uh, site, it's uh, on the bottom, but I will actually show this link for several times in this. For this tutorial, we are going to use JupyterLab. And it's very convenient to use for tutorials because it allows you to just click and follow the step. Actually, Jupyter Labs are great if you want to have some kind of interactive analysis. Uh, but uh, the first question that I want to answer is, uh, are we really want to run Junt out of Jupyter? And the answer to this, uh, that in our software, we, everything is organized in layers, where we have a Jupyter lab and uh, this graphical user interface of top, but we are not trying to kind of uh, replace everything with buttons. And if you just don't want to use it, uh, you can use just Python and scripts. If you don't want to use Python, you can use uh, root macros and whatever is close to you, or just compile and run everything just on your machine. We'll show how to do this. Uh, but the, one of the good idea uh, and uh, one of the powerful things that we are working on with Jupyter Lab is uh, to have this workflow in mind that you use Jupyter. You can use Jupyter one of the uh, uh, machines and BNL or Jefferson Lab Jupyter servers to actually try your configuration to run Jant a little bit maybe for so some small set of events, uh, generate uh, and see that it actually generates what you want. And then uh, you will have a one more button like send it to grid or send it for processing. So uh, we are working on uh, integration with OSG and uh, we kind of first time uh, promised it in August. And since then we did a lot of uh, work to accomplish this and we actually almost there. So we have actually prototypes working. So please stay tuned. Uh, pretty soon we will uh, probably release and announce it how you can not only run this chant uh, in uh, this container or something, but actually how you can submit uh, your uh, jobs to OSG. Let's go actually to tutorial and let's do a dive in. So uh, you have to run this command in uh, your console. So actually run docker image that you, I hope you downloaded. And uh, the command is uh, pretty long this time, a little bit longer than in previous tutorials. So it's docker rm minus it the sports 888 and 60 electron ion collider epic graphical user interface. And I'm giving some time for you to uh, actually type it in your console. Uh, please, anybody, tell me uh, that uh, you got there, that you are there, and uh, let me actually do this myself. So I'll try to keep it open. Right. So you can look at this comment. And you can find, uh, just in case, this comment on our help site. So you can copy past it from there and you can copy paste it from a Dika page. Uh, so here is actually the command in terminal. And uh, when I run it, it prints two addresses. Uh, so first is localhost with port 8888 and the second is uh, 680. Uh, so I open the web browser and put localhost. 8888, like this, and uh, that's what you should see there. So I a little bit go back to this page one more time, so you can uh, copy this comment. And please, anybody, if anybody following, so please tell me that you got to running Jupiter.
Anybody? I don't know if I'm a good test person, but but I have the container up. Can can someone else confirm? Yeah, I got it. Okay, good. Now I know not that you actually hear me, <laughs> and I did all those talking. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. So let's actually proceed with Docker container. So uh, here is a Jupyter lab, and on the left side uh, you can see uh, the folders, and uh, that this time we will use the second folder called 0 0.2 uh, full sim tutorial. So please uh, double click and navigate there, and we need 101 dive in. So that is the first file in the list. So I double click on it and that's what you should see there. So uh, this is a dive in example. Uh, this is an open charm analysis made by Yulia and it actually shows uh, smeared and not smeared plots uh, produced uh, in our uh, previous tutorials. But still, uh, so you, if you uh, have been on previous tutorials, you're probably uh, familiar already with this uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook, but still it's very convenient to use it to get yourself familiar with Jupyter. So as you can see, there is a, uh, there is a nice formatted text. There are images, there are plots in the Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, I know there are people who are very familiar with Jupyter. I know there are some people who actually might be uh, visited uh, the first tutorials on uh, January 9th and we already went through this. But uh, for those who may be not familiar with Jupyter, I have to go and make very brief but very simple explanation what you see here and what's happening. So uh, this shell around us with those files and everything called Jupyter Lab. And this open documents, a document called a Jupyter Notebook. And as you can see, the notebook consists of cells. And some of the cells might be uh, the text and uh, some other cells are code, which is now written in Python, but there might be other languages. And for example, this Docker image has a C++ with, uh, uh, with root. So you can actually write root matrices instead of uh, Python if you would like to. So, uh, if I double click on this text on the top, it actually shows me uh, the markup language uh, behind it and it's written in markdown language. If you don't know what is markdown, it's a markup language very similar to what Wiki uses. Now, if uh, we press on this play button on the top with this small triangle button on the top, uh, this uh, Markdown text will come back, uh, will convert back to actually nice rendered text. You see this blue uh, marker over here, it actually shows which cell is active. So now the active is the next cell. The next cell is the code. So as you can guess, and by the way, let me, uh, let me go to presentation mode, which will make everything a little bit a little bit larger and I can make it a little bit even more larger for your convenience. So when I play this, uh, when I press this play button, as you can guess, uh, the hello EIC will be printed out. But the output of the cells might be much more complex objects. So the next cell actually prints a, a, a latex formula and we'll be actually clicking uh, all along uh, this tutorial on the cells. So we'll build uh, plots. Uh, they will be a little different plots than uh, in this uh, particular things and the plots will be interactive. So please proceed to 201, process Monte Carlo file, uh, Jupyter Notebook. All right, uh, okay, let me close the first one. All right, so in this tool one, uh, we will uh, first process uh, the Monteca, we will first run our G4E simulation and process some Hervic file. So it's done where this uh, G4E Pi, a small Python library that is made to easily configure uh, and run actually, uh, manipulate G4E from the Python. 
So uh, I selected the first cell, so now it's active, and I press the display button. And uh, what just happened is just uh, some import, some stuff. So, and the second one, second cell actually configures the giant for G4E. And if you don't know Python or you definitely don't know this library, I assume that just reading uh, would be enough to understand what's happening. So, we create instance of this G4E, G4EIC, we ask detector to be a J-like, we ask beamline to be a rig. So, and the source file is this Herwig uh, 20,000 uh, events in HEPMC format, and this thing is smart enough to identify that it's a HEPMC, it will automatically set the right parameters to open the HEPMC file. So, the output should be started with hello, and bmon should be familiar for you if you are a giant expert, means process 200 events. Let's just run this configuration. It's done. So, if I just have this object on the line and I click on the third cell, it just prints itself what's, how it's been configured and what's happening. Finally, I uh, run the G4E start, and it starts to process the events. So, uh, while it's processing events, uh, I can actually look at this run command. And that is actually the command that was run on behind the scenes. So, as you can see, we don't hide anything with Python library or something. And we just called G4E uh, and uh, gave it this hello.run.macro. And we said that we want your output uh, be base name hello. And so the event is processed, and you can see it created a lot of files. So let's actually first go and look what was in this hello.run macro file. So it's probably my screen is on the bottom. I double click on it, and it opens in the editor. So you see it's just a standard uh, jump for macro file where we input some base uh, file for GLAG detector. We actually set the beam line. We uh, configure HEPMC uh, file uh, opener and just run initialized and beam on 200 events. But there are other files generated. So one of them is uh, a GDML file with geometry, but it's not really interesting for us. The second one is actually a root file with tgeo on it. If you double click on this hello.geo.root like this, it opens in a root browser. It's a root 7 uh, new things uh, browser for root. We're actually working together with root team very closely to make it happen for this Jupyter and use of Jupyter. And on the left, you see this file, and you see the objects in this file in this is the detector underscore geo. If I click the right button, so the right mouse button, I have an option to draw. I don't go into this option, I just click draw. And it draws a, a J-like detector with a PNL beam line. So like this. So there is a small uh, square button on the bottom called toggle control user interface. If I click on it, uh, there the first thing is a clipping option. So I can actually clip this detector and see it's in the clipping option. And if I actually double click on uh, this detector underscore geo, I can see and navigate the internals and let me actually navigate somewhere inside our solenoid and show uh, vertex detector planes. So I can draw it over here. So yeah, here is the planes of uh, the vertex detector. And I'm showing them to you because right in the next uh, Jupyter notebooks we'll be uh, building uh, occupancy floats for this vertex detector and I just wanted you to see the form of it. Here it is. But before that, let's actually proceed and see what the other output files that were produced. So another root file which is produced by uh, uh, this Jan4 is hello.root. If I double click on it, uh, we see there is a, a T3 called events, and this event has a pretty simplified and flattened uh, tree of heat tracks, uh, vertexes, generated particles that were used uh, for this thing. And for example, if I double click on this heat underscore Z, I can see uh, uh, the Z distribution of uh, heats in the detector. 
So uh, uh, we in the, right in the next example we actually process we will process this root file and some make some analysis out of it. But now let's uh, finish with these files. So the last file I wanted to show you is called hello dot run dot json if i double click on it it's json files and this file is created by this g4e pi library and it holds the information the configuration information it knew before it run uh, when, when it runs this g4e and actually this file might be important because if you would like to kind of run uh, the same configuration because this uh, library can load this file and uh, even our reconstruction framework uh, where this file and for example if you want to run the simulation with the exactly same configuration as I did so uh, this file uh, that you may use uh, you may just load this file run and you will run the same configuration as I did something like this okay now let's proceed to 202 and we'll process, uh, build some actually occupancy plot and process analysis. So uh, there are actually many ways how you can process root files. So we'll be processing a root file in this, uh, in, in this notebook uh, that we just created. And there are many ways how you can process it. So in previous tutorials on uh, general 9, we used T3 draw. Uh, and this time we will use just uh, Python tools and data science tools to produce some plots. We'll use a root library which allows to open root files in Python without root actually. So uh, you don't have to have uh, root installed to process uh, the root files. And we'll use uh, data science tools like uh, pandas and plotly to actually build the articles this time we will uh, not click all the cells i mean by alone like one by one and i propose you to click here run on the top menu and there's option run all cells so run on the top and run all cells and it starts uh, actually producing uh, processing the file and producing some plots. Uh, since uh, going into uproot tutorials, it's outside of this tutorial, I will not actually uh, go into details how this thing works. I hope it will encourage you to learn this uh, data science tool if you haven't done so already. But basically what we do, we just uh, get hits out of uh, this tree with some maybe energy loss and volume names. And then we create so-called pandas data frame, uh, which is very, very uh, uh, nice and uh, good tool to make analysis. So then uh, we actually do some filtering and say that, okay, I want this vertex hits, which is going to be uh, happened in uh, volume of vertex. And then that's it. We're just making plots out of this thing. So the first plot is a heat occupancy in the vertex detector, and uh, you saw it's just created actually in one line, where you say that we want to x, by x, y, by y, and color by volume, uh, so it's colored by uh, uh, layers. So uh, the next plot is the same plot, but in uh, 3D. So it's actually uh, occupancy plots on the vector detectors in 3D. But now the colors are not uh, layers, but actually energy deposition. So it's called uh, in the heat. So it's colored by energy deposition. Since we actually get used to work with uh, histograms, uh, so it's uh, here is the example how you can build a histogram in a, a nice and convenient for us way. And finally, the last plot in this uh, Jupyter notebook is something else. We use actually gem hits. Uh, so it's uh, in um, ion end cap layers. Uh, it shows by color also uh, layers of uh, gem detector hits. So you can see it over here. So uh, this notebook should actually illustrate you that uh, you can do a certain analysis right out of uh, uh, this Jump 4 uh, simulation. And one of the uh, very important analysis that should be uh, important for in terms of yellow book studies is this kind of analysis. Like uh, if I had 
uh, particle of particles of particular type and I have uh, these distributions uh, of this particle in the beginning like from generator so how this distribution will look uh, if the particle hit some volume for example zero degree calorimeter or far forward Roman pulse or something like this so and basically all such kind of analysis is possible to do with just the output uh, of uh, jump 4 but also uh, you can use our reconstruction framework and uh, if you follow 2 or 3 it's going to be a quick example how you can uh, use uh, this JANA reconstruction framework to actually do your analysis of the JAN4 output. So we had, uh, I will not go into details here really, because uh, we had uh, these tutorials on the uh, first introductory tutorials before, and we probably will have uh, reconstruction tutorials in future, where in details you will write the JANA plugins and uh, figure out how it works. So now I just wanted to show that uh, this JANA knows how to deal uh, this GFUE output, and you can just process it. So uh, JANA also has its own Python uh, library, which helps uh, configure it. Uh, once again, not going into details, uh, this plugin means uh, of one uh, kind of module in JANA, which usually uh, just do one thing. So uh, first plugin we use uh, just uh, reads the GFUE output. Then this open term is actually this Yulia analysis which you saw on the first plot, which actually builds those pictures. Uh, then uh, we just say what the output should be and what is the source files, and we actually run it, and it processes this 200 events. Uh, and if you see over here, this hello processed file is created. If we open it, it has this open champ folder, and it has some plots in it. So if I uh, once again draw X and Q square, there's not many points. Certainly we just process 200 events, right? Uh, I just draw it with call, something like this, but still it's uh, kind of know of each other and you have to know that it's pretty easy to use one out of other. But so let's actually proceed. Let's go to 204. And it's going to be a really short crash course to Jupiter, and, uh, because I hope that uh, up until now everything works fine for you, and uh, nothing hang, and everything uh, work as expected. But at the same time, uh, there might be things like you run something and it's uh, and it's hung, or it's uh, taking too long, you want to stop it. So here we actually briefly describe what is happening. So as uh, uh, you can guess if you run things in browser, uh, this means that there should be a server. And also it's obvious that server actually runs in the Docker image. But what's important out of it is that uh, each uh, this notebook, how it runs and where it actually run executes this code. It's executed in the kernel. So in kernel is kind of a process that is created for each notebook and where actually things are executed. And uh, for now, for example, if you look at this top right corner, uh, we state that we are now using the Python 3 kernel. If uh, we run like file, new, notebook, please don't follow me, I'm just showing you, right? So there will be a possible options of the kernel, and one of them will be root C++. So once again, if you don't want to use Python, you can use uh, root out of this notebook. Right, and uh, uh, there. So, and actually, it's very important in terms of uh, running Jan from Jupiter. So, because people ask, uh, so I am running Jan in Jupiter. It's done something. No, actually, uh, it just spawns a process on this machine, and uh, this process in the kernel. And then the question actually goes: if you want to run Jan on this machine or not, if this machine is something like Slurm or maybe it's your just laptop or whatever. But there is no kind of any magic behind it. 
So uh, there is an option how you can uh, deal with if you kernel if you have some code which, uh, for example, taking too long. There is a, a menu called kernel, so on the top, and this has a lot of options like, for example, restart kernel, change kernel, you can interrupt kernel if it's uh, taking too long. And actually this run menu that we already uh, know that there is a run all cells, there's a last option calls restart kernel and run all cells. It kind of restarts the background. And uh, just in case you have any glitches in, uh, in foreground, you can certainly just uh, uh, renew the browser page and it will just work if everything is saved. Everything should be fine with that. So let's uh, actually proceed to the next uh, uh, part, which is 301, and which actually shows that, uh, okay, now we are running in Jupyter and uh, maybe running uh, jumped in Jupyter is okay. But since we are approaching the second part where we are going to uh, do some code hacking, it might be already not convenient to change uh, too much code in the uh, in the Jupyter. I mean, all this tutorial will be in Jupyter and you'll be actually not really doing the code change by yourself. But in general, uh, when you start using this Docker image and you want to actually edit your code. So there is a way how you can, uh, there's another way how you can uh, deal with this Docker. And one of them is VNC. So if you copy this link, which is localhost at port 6080 to the second tab. So like this, I am following this localhost port 6080 and I hit enter. I actually enter this no VNC, which is web uh, browser based VNC player, which actually connects to our Docker image. And I click connect. And uh, the password is really simple one, two, three, four, five, six. It's uh, written back in the Jupyter lab once again. It's 301. And that's what you want to put there. So uh, that is the VNC system, and as you can see, it has some uh, scaling problem with uh, my window. So to fix this, I press, here is the menu for this uh, no VNC, right? And if I click settings, uh, there's an the option clip to window, and I choose uh, remote resizing like this, and bam, I have a system in my browser. So this was this options and clip to window scaling mode remote resizing. Uh, so I have access to the internal system and I actually can use here and now we will show the Jant uh, 4 uh, native event display with the same GLAG detector and with the same event. So I start the terminal. We are in, let me actually make it larger for you. Maybe to make it more convenient. So we are inside this tutorial folder. So we have to go to 0.2. You actually don't have to follow me here. I just wanted to show you how you can extend it way, how you can use this Docker and actually to do some file editing or actually hacking using this container. And we will run uh, this Python file which is called zero, uh, zero, th oh, sorry, 302, event display in VNC. And if I open it, it's just a Python file. It has already familiar uh, lines to you. So it's just using the same G4EPI library. And uh, the only change here is that we added this dot this function, which as you can guess, uh, actually uh, uh, tells Jant that you want to run in the visualization mode and show event display. So let's, I type Python 3, we're using Python 3, there's uh, no Python 2 anymore this year, 202, right, event display in CPI, I just hit enter, and it starts processing. Uh, it's actually just run Jant and runs event display. 
it uh, takes some time before uh, it's run in uh, uh, software mode so just give it a few more seconds but as you can see it's just a standard 10.6 uh, 10.67 uh, display and here is our detector let me zoom in a little bit Yes, it's a gel-like detector with this ERIC beam line in it and some event running out of it. All right, so now you know that uh, you can not use or you can use not only Jupyter Lab. Actually, uh, this uh, container has uh, some tools uh, that can be helpful for uh, code development or something. So uh, it includes it's called Codium. It's a free VS Code, uh, like we have a Chrome and Chromium. We have VS Code and Codium uh, development ID, which you can open G4E uh, project. It will catch up with uh, CMake automatically, and it's a very nice environment to actually to work and to edit the code. But it just goes outside of this tutorial. So, okay, let us proceed with the tutorials. Uh, to do so, I actually have to come back to presentation just for a little bit. So, uh, besides Jupyter and uh, no uh, VNC, you can actually access to this Docker image by any VNC viewer, or you can use it with X11 directly. It uh, uh, requires some configuration, so we didn't use it for uh, this particular tutorial, right? But it's very easy for you to just to use uh, X11 and uh, don't bother with VNCs. And also there are social options for remote debugging. So uh, now we are coming to the second part of our tutorial. How you can add a detector to G4E and what is the internals of G4E? So let me actually make a small pause and uh, maybe for you to catch up. If you have any questions for about the first part, please uh, ask the questions. Okay, I suppose there's no questions up until this point. Okay, so the second part where we are going to uh, uh, first create a detector, uh, then uh, move in this uh, Yaroslav Lumi monitor detector into G4E and uh, go into internals of this G4E. So let me actually uh, show you several slides about the internals and this information that you need to do this. So first, actually, what is this, how this G4E is made and uh, what is this? So one of the ideas and core ideas of the whole G4E, by the way, there is a link out to it. Uh, is that to keep everything close to road jump 4 uh, and we are using 10.6 right now. So uh, if you are a jump expert and uh, you are familiar with this book uh, for application developer, if you're familiar with uh, those examples that jump provides, like advanced example or something, and you can open any of this example and more or less understand what's happening inside, it should be absolutely fine for you to open G4E code and uh, navigate there and understand what's actually happening. And we try to keep the code base, I mean that uh, the code that we create uh, for this infrastructure to be very small, to be it in giant way, and uh, to keep the compilation time fast. Uh, and uh, as, as I said before, we really try to stick to giant for paradigms and think this coding is okay. That if users are going just provided the code, they just go to code and they just code whatever they want. And if they uh, are giant experts, it should be enough for them to actually do the work. So uh, usually the question is, uh, where is your detector construction? And the answer, okay, here is our detector construction, right? So, but we have some recommendations how we organize the existing detectors and uh, how actually they interfere with each other and uh, the rest of the tutorials actually will be more like uh, talking about uh, the recommendations for Jump4E, but those are in form of recommendation. 
Uh, basically, it's just a bar crawl. Here is our code, here is our detect the construction actions, and you can do whatever you want now with it. Uh, the complexity behind it is that we have two beam lines. So now we have ERIC and JLike implemented in uh, G4E. Uh, there are several master detectors. So we at this point have only JLike implemented in G4E, but uh, there is a possibility actually to switch master detectors and have master detectors, right? And there are certainly sub detectors. So uh, now we have 24 sub detectors, at least uh, some of them are stops, some of them uh, have some details, and some of them have more details, right? And uh, the idea behind this is that uh, you can actually switch things and uh, the same sub detectors might be used for uh, different uh, master detectors because if you for example look at beast and j like they are pretty uh, close to each other in design right and uh, what detect sub detectors need for it if uh, they are now used in j like or now they are used in uh, beast is uh, some kind of configuration that is provided to them like what is the exact size, uh, what is, for example, the number of planes, something, information like this. So in terms of a uh, detector developer, you are now actually sitting in this uh, green uh, square, right? And uh, you develop your detector probably in a separate repository, absolutely standalone. So how you actually import it uh, to your G4E? There are actually five ways how you can import uh, or work with detector with G4E. First, as obviously, you can just create a detector uh, uh, right inside the G4E. It's John 4 and uh, you just create a, a folder in appropriate place and start working with the detector. And we will do this in this tutorial. So uh, the second option is uh, you have a detector as a library and you can attach it as a library and we will do this also in this tutorial with Luminosity Monitor. If your detector is in root geometry, uh, it's possible to input it and uh, we have to provide the example uh, in future for, for it, but it's possible we use VGM library for this. Uh, finally, if you have a step file format, so we just got a uh, interaction point from uh, BNL, so it probably will be a good example uh, that will put also how you can exit step file. And uh, final, very interesting option, you can write uh, your detector in Python, because for some time, Jant actually comes with official Python binding to Jant. And uh, uh, I saw notebooks already with detector, but I haven't seen any real detector groups which using Python to actually develop their detectors. Probably there are, but I just haven't seen it. Uh, but the really interesting about this example that uh, when you actually run this code, uh, this Python code and detector run, it actually runs on full C++ speed because uh, those uh, classes are just uh, bindings, so when you connect them to the uh, Jant uh, run manager, it actually just connects the real C++ objects underneath, so it works pretty fast. Uh, still, it's uh, in future, uh, we'll show how to do this, but it probably it's not our main priority right now. And uh, the important actually here is that we await that for yellow pages, uh, people will have their separate repositories, right, with detectors. And they would prefer actually to leave it uh, the same way. I mean, they will not kind of import the detectors to G4E and start developing in G4E, right? So, so we try to create some infrastructure which uh, helps and makes it easier just to work with uh, your detector as a standalone project and you just can move to G4E and see how things are there. So you can look at uh, everything I'll show in this prism that you're a detector developer, you have your own repository, you want to check, change it. Okay, uh, the next slide. Uh, in terms of uh, volumes, uh, and here we have a hierarchical uh, detector uh, placement. So like a sensor detector has some volumes with uh, end caps and end caps uh, has already some kind of detectors. And uh, each detector usually has its outer volume. 
and sometimes and then in the sub uh, auto volume has detected elements and sometimes you just don't want to create so elements you maybe just uh, this main volume is enough for you uh, so and uh, final slide which is probably required before we can continue uh, with the interactive tutorial is actually our naming convention so we name detectors uh, uh, based on where they are placed and uh, this starts with uh, two or three letters abbreviation beginning so C is central so for example CI means central uh, iron end cup or CB means central barrel or something FFE means far forward electron so for example uh, central barrel vertex detector will be CB underscore VTX or uh, the detector that we will be working on luminosity monitor will be far forward electron under uh, FFE underscore lumi like this and uh, you actually already saw these names in the examples uh, and the geometry when we run it and you see these names in the C++ code and class names and in variable names and uh, if your beauty of C++ say that hey you cannot just name things like this there should be another naming convention we kind of uh, make exception for detector names and geometry and the reason behind it because we want those detector names and this naming to be consistent across everywhere so if we are uh, uh, work with geometry uh, that's the name and if uh, we go to the root files you find the same name if you go to analysis you find the same name and it makes uh, everything convenient when you work with it for example if I want all hits in the central detector I just want all hits uh, in volume starting with C uh, right uh, <clears throat> so it makes actually this exception uh, work and pretty convenient to work with so the next slide is actually also some examples of naming some different detectors i will not go into details here you can actually look uh, after it by yourself okay let me go back to the uh, go back to jupiter lab and by the way uh, in uh, this jupiter lab directory full simulation there's a PDF file called Full Simulation Tutorials. Like this, you can uh, click on it, and it has uh, uh, this presentation I'm talking, I, I'm using. So you can just look it inside your browser. It has everything in it. Okay, let's go to 401, and we start actually exploring this G4E with. Uh, Kind of first steps how you install it on your machine without docker or something like this or where it's installed in docker uh, to do this we use uh, this package called egpm which originally abbreviated like eic jana packet manager uh, while it's not really a packet manager and it's not really for jana uh, it's uh, more like smart python written build scripts which allows to build uh, things with their dependencies so uh, <clears throat> it's a 401 into the software and first thing that I wanted to show you actually is that if you uh, with exclamation side uh, you can put console commands into the Jupyter lab so for example if I put exclamation side and ls and run the cell it prints the uh, what's what's happening in in this folder right so i can certainly do something like this and uh, now i'll be calling command uh, egpm without any parameters so i call this ejana package manager egpm when i call it it just prints me everything it knows uh, about the software uh, so uh, here we have uh, this G4E installed in this directory, containers app G4E, G4E dev. And also, uh, if also I can actually run it here, GPM. Uh, please don't follow me, I'm just showing you that uh, it's available on the system level. 
right? And uh, one more useful feature, if you'll be using uh, this outside of uh, the Jupyter Lab, you probably might need the environment, and it actually provides the environment script that sets up all the software which is installed. In Docker, it's everything done automatically, but if you would like to actually. So you can get uh, some additional information about uh, the directories and where the GFUI is built by this command, uh, gpmpv pwd gfue so i just running the second one and uh, i want to tell you that if you uh, since uh, gfue has pretty kind of small dependencies it's pretty easy to install it on uh, your machine just without docker and everything you can install this eGPM just by pip, python pip it's a central python repository by just installing pip install eGPM and then you can uh, you have to, you will have to specify your top directory where everything is installed and you can just install uh, g4e with cgpm so here's a link to its official page and on the official page you have a pretty good instructions how you actually do this and you can for example set up where is your location of your root so not to reinstall the root and stuff like this so uh, second very important stuff uh, which is shown on this page for example okay we provided you g4e and you start changing it and you want to save your work somehow right so for this you create a fork in the repository or a branch in the repository and now you want uh, to work with this branch and it's easy configurable with this eGPM you just run these comments and it say that okay for now for g4e you will work with this branch or even with this repository so it will get the g4e from this branch and repository so uh, sorry for this introduction to eGPM but I know that many people actually find it very useful just to install everything on their machine open in their beloved editor I'm one of them and uh, I just wanted to show how to do this now we come to very important step for the further of our tutorials so now we know where this G4E uh, uh, located and we want to link that directory to this folder to the name G4E so you have to run this command in order to continue uh, with all the further tutorials so let me actually run it and uh, when I run, uh, the link is created. I can actually hit the update button, and here is the director with G4E. So please run uh, this. This is the last comment of 401. Or actually, if we hit 402, 402 you will find this comment on the first line, and you have to run it in order to complete uh, these tutorials. So, like once again, it will say that I already have this link. Uh, okay, we have the source code. Uh, the final question is uh, how you can, uh, because if we are going to change the code, how we are going to rebuild it. And here we have uh, another uh, handy class in this G4E Pi library, I mean handy for Jupyter notebooks, which allows to build, uh, to, to, to build uh, G4E. So, uh, it just uh, we didn't change anything so it was pretty fast to build and if you see the run comment there's nothing fancy it's just a CMake so if you don't like Jupyter don't like Python whatever you can just use it to learn where things are and then just use comments in your console and work with console not with this thing we don't hide anything now we have everything to proceed with adding a sub detector so let's go to 501 uh, last call to call this uh, to run this uh, uh, function uh, to run this line to create link to the source code because we'll use it intensively <coughs> adding a sub detector because actually doing adding the sub detector uh, let me uh, quickly show you what is the directory structure of G4E and where we have to add sub detectors and where are the sub detectors and where everything actually. If I navigate here to G4E, there is a source folder. So it's just a CMake here and the source folder and there's a, a not, not very many files. So two 
folders are important. One folder is main detectors. So in main detectors, uh, there is a J-like, and uh, if you ask where is the detector construction, here is our detector construction, and we actually will be working with it. So here is J-like detector construction and other stuff like this. The other uh, important folder in sources is subdetectors. And uh, you may actually see the names. Uh, they should be already familiar for you after this naming convention. So uh, this is uh, the folder with subdetectors. So if I go back actually to our uh, tutorial on subdetectors, let me by the way close a lot of tabs. So what uh, one uh, actually does to create a subdetector is just create a subfolder in subdetectors and put uh, some file to actually insulate this detector. Uh, fortunately, once again, this handy uh, for ac manager allows to create this tab automatically. So I play, I hit this play button and it just say that it created this FFE Lumi far forward electron luminosity monitor detector with this just single FFE Lumi HH file. So uh, you can click on, this, uh, click on this link, not to follow to the uh, directory. You can just click on this link to open this file and see what is generated, right? Uh, so the file has two classes. Uh, one is called Lumi config and the other actually class called Lumi Design. And uh, it has two functions, one function called Construct and the other function can Construct Detectors. It also has uh, some pointers to volumes and basically that's it. Besides there's a commented out uh, constructor with something called initialization context, but we'll cover this in the end of our tutorial. So. Uh, just forget about it right now. So what are these classes and what are this FFE Lumi HH file? Let me go back quickly to uh, the uh, presentation. So uh, everything is constructed in master detector construction. So you saw this J-like uh, detector construction file. So we try to keep uh, the construction in configuration in that file and each sub detector has such uh, uh, design, or as we call it, construction, uh, detector design file, where it actually constructs volumes and stuff. So uh, this line, uh, this dashed lines actually try to say that a master detector don't really know about uh, the subdetector internals, right? As well as subdetector don't know anything about the master detector constructions and uh, surroundings and things like this. And they communicate with fields of this detector config. Uh, things. We, you, we, we will actually go into this into detail, so it's just a... And it creates actually uh, its internals in this detector design files. If you remember, I showed uh, this uh, picture about the nested volumes hierarchy, right? So, uh, and I say that each detector uh, has out the volume and then uh, has uh, uh, already all elements in this volume. So usually this construct method, which is first out of two methods, used just to create the outer volume for the detector. And uh, this construct detectors method is used to create all internals of the detector if it's actually needed. So knowing this, let's actually go back and uh, do some changes to it, we will add some uh, dummy volume to this detector and add uh, this Lumi config to our detector construction. So let's proceed to 502, adding a volume. So in this tutorial, you uh, we will not actually do coding by our hands because the time is pretty limited and uh, we it's pretty easy to uh, lose track uh, when somebody is coding and people are watching. So we just have uh, already changed files and uh, as you can see this comment just replace uh, files uh, in the directory in the right place of the directory, right? So we will just say what are the changes 
and if I open this 5 FFE Lumi H uh, for you if you in the evening will try to use this docker image as a documentation how you put the detector you can see what are the changes on this step by uh, those arrows like this so it went a little bit out of screen for me so first to add volumes we add some size and position parameters to config and then uh, we in this lumi design file we will just create a dummy box for luminosity monitor that's basically it and uh, the changes are really trivial to jlike detector construction too if i click this five detector construction h and i will also follow these arrows what we do we just add include file of this uh, lumi monitor over here you see and uh, somewhere down the file i just uh, we just create this uh, ffe lumi design as a member of this class and that's it so nothing absolutely no magic no any code or something and right in this on the detector construction implementation class like in very very end we actually what is done here we call these two functions construct and construct detectors for now we are just using default lumi config we'll come to config in the very end so uh, and there might be uh, some for other detectors there might be some other stuff here but uh, for simplicity of this tutorial we just use the simplest thing we just call two functions construct and construct detector one by one so everything is should be pretty simple that simple i come back to this 502 and run this cell with three copy files actually to change uh, our detector construction and this explanation is once again if you are going to actually sit at some point and do this tutorial by yourself uh, you can use this as documentation it states what's actually happening what is changing so uh, you can use it after uh, so we change the files and we proceed to 503 testing so first we need to build uh, our stuff so i run the first cell to actually start building process so the building process actually we as i said we try to keep uh, building times very fast and uh, this is probably the worst uh, building case scenario because i'm using the docker for windows which actually uses virtual box and the virtual box actually uses the hyperx so uh, bottom line is that it's rock solid slow io <laughs> Uh, still uh, usually it takes around uh, 10 to 20 seconds and on uh, right machines it should be under 10 seconds or something if you change just a couple of files okay we've done build of g4e and we run with just one event because we just want to see the changes in the geometry uh, we run it it processed so yeah everything is done and we have to create test ffe lumi file somewhere here yes here it is we follow this uh, test ffe lumi .geo root file uh, and i draw it and yes you see this large box is this outer volume that we just created on this step all right uh if it were just a standalone detector or some detector that you can just create inside this g4e you could start from here and put some detector elements in it and you can see the other detectors how they are done and uh, actually follow it but me we now go to six uh unit six six of one of how we will add this luminosity monitor uh to it and uh first cell in the 601 so it's 601 explore lumi monitor and in first cell we just uh actually clone it from gitlab so it's master branch it should be here and before actually proceeding with uh, the other cells like moving to the right position let me actually go into this luminosity monitor and quickly show what's actually happening there and what should be done in terms of uh, integration into the g4e 
So a luminosity monitor. Uh, if we go to, uh, so it's just a CMake and uh, GIF we also use CMake. So it's very easy to integrate. If we open the CMake, you see that it creates a library called that. Uh, please remember this, the library is called that. It's not really kind of self-explanatory. We probably will fix it with Yaroslav and maybe Yaroslav will uh, or move the detector under G4E, but for now just remember it's create a library called that. And then uh, what else we have here? We have a run Mac, and I just opened this run Mac to show you that uh, it has some uh, custom uh, macro uh, definitions that actually turns on and off sub detectors of the Lumi monitor. So uh, we don't we have to don't forget to include it uh, when we run it over there. So then everything else is pretty much close that you can find in uh, G uh, John four uh, uh, tutorials and examples. So it has main files where everything is initialized. And if we go to source code, first is action initialization. So if we go to action initialization and see that it's used event action and run action. This text reader is generator action. We will not use it. We have our own generator generation act action, right? Uh, so, and here is the detector construction that actually will be the main class uh, which we'll use. And uh, what happens uh, here is something that we are going to change. So, uh, and that's going to be the only change to uh, that we made to this container. So you see in detector construction construct, Lumi monitor create its own vault. And we also create our own vault, right? So we want to actually split this function in two. One will create vault and the other will just uh, populate vault with uh, everything is there and thus and that's going to be the only change. So in terms of, once again, uh, uh, this possibility that you work with your own uh, repo with the detector, uh, so nothing will be breaking, right? Uh, so you just uh, use this change and after it, you can work it either standalone or in uh, terms of G4E. And then it creates uh, some sub detectors and while it might look uh, kind of uh, simple stuff, uh, there are some logic behind it, which Yaroslav put there. So uh, there are some uh, common detector class. Uh, so actually, so this uh, five detectors in the Lumi monitor actually use this common detector class. So there is some logic that we don't want to copy past to G4E or something. What we want to do is as minimum as possible, and we will just use this detector construction construct method to construct everything in Lumi Monitor, right? Uh, so let me close it and uh, go back to actually this tutorial. And now what I do uh, in this, uh, so it's 601. Explore luminosity. There are two more cells to do. First, I just move this Elmon folder to the right uh, uh, directory, so to sub detectors if you feel Lumi. And uh, just for sake of uh, uh, JIT, I just remove this JIT uh, folder in it. But in reality, when you uh, put detector to G4E or something, you can uh, just use a JIT sub uh, project or something to work with it so but it's outside of this tutorial so uh, what just happened i put uh, the directory with luminosity monitor to its place to sub detectors ffe lumi folder let me quickly actually go there so it's sources sub detectors we have this ffe lumi and that's what i wanted to show you now we have this design file and we have a folder with all the logic and internals and actually the library uh, with this luminosity monitor. To integrate it with uh, G4E, uh, so we first have to integrate its CMake with our CMake. It's uh, really easy to do. So uh, for geometry, as I said, we will call just detector construction construct method to build everything. 
And then we should also link uh, its user action. And uh, in the end, we'll talk a little bit about the configuration. And we don't have to forget uh, some custom macro commands from the run Mac. So let's actually do the changes and uh, do the plan. So uh, first we have to uh, modify this luminosity monitor. So as I said before, we want to split uh, this construct methods into two. One will create uh, volume and is used for uh, volt uh, and is used for standalone uh, version of it. And the second uh, will just accept uh, the initial volumes and will create all the detectors inside them. And once again, we just run this uh, copy command. So it's 602. It has the only cell which just copies modified files over there. Just let me quickly open it called hacked detector construction so we see what happened uh, so now we have two construct methods in lumi monitor first is created volume vault over here and the second just accepts some mother volume and creates all detectors underneath that's exactly what we need for g4e and once again there is an explanation if you would like to do this at home in the evening so uh, we proceed to 603 and now we will add uh, this uh, Lumi monitor to our CMake system and to our design file. Uh, I can click this play button and I will explain what are the changes. So in terms of CMake file, uh, you can find it uh, uh, by the name is 6. Subdetector CMake over here is pretty easy. We just add two lines. First line add this luminosity monitor L Elmon directory to CMake. So now CMake know each other. And the second one says that G4E now wants detector this dead library in it. So that's it, all changes. And uh, the same simple changes goes to this design file. So we call it six final FFE Lumi HH. So this is final version of our design file. We change some parameters a little bit, uh, corresponding to uh, what was in the detector construction of Lumi monitor. I just whatever put the values there, and uh, we added detector construct uh, in construct detectors method. So, and this detector is actually luminosity monitor detector construction. It doesn't have any namespace. It doesn't have like Lumi monitor or whatever detector construction. So it's just called detector construction. So we use it. So not really have explaining name, but anyway. So that is uh, the only change we made. So called uh, luminosity monitor construct with our volumes. Oh yeah, probably the last change we make uh, this auto volume invisible. So that's it. Let me go back to 603. Just to be sure I run one more time the cell, copy this updated file to the right place. And we can actually see what happened. So 604, once again, we built everything. And while it builds, uh, Here's now it will actually first build luminosity monitor. You see, it's just uh, CMake grabbed uh, luminosity monitor CMake and it's just build it. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, uh, here we added those comments that enables uh, the sub detectors of luminosity monitor. You see, there is a comment function which allows you to put any number of whatever you like uh, execution comments for Jant. So it should be ended already, probably. Yes. And uh, we run uh, this once again with just the one uh, with just the one event just actually to build the geometry and see what's happening. And uh, yes, those parameters. Oh, now I'm using actually beamline J like just to switch it and to show you stuff. So play. Bam, everything is created. And 
it's named test full. So yes, here is this test full geo.root. And I throw it over here. And those small things on the end is actually parts of luminosity monitor. Let me actually open it in the normal chant for event viewer to show me more uh, precisely. So uh, I open, I am back here. And uh, the last file we have is called 605 show JOVNC. So it's once again Python 3 base. And it runs the event viewer. Give it a second. Yeah, so here is actually the internals of if, uh, what, what showed Yaroslav, the internals of this uh, luminosity monitor. So we actually put the luminosity monitor as a library to this project. It's actually probably outside of the place where it should be, but that's already kind of expert work to figure out where it should be the right position and it goes outside of scope of this tutorial. So, uh, Please, for experts, probably Yaroslav will put this uh, to our stuff. And by the way, here is the uh, here you see the difference. Here is the J-like uh, uh, beamline elements uh, for far forward ion region over here. All right. So uh, this was actually the final part of the interactive tutorial. We have uh, one more very important topic to discuss, and then there will be uh, uh, questions and answers to this. Uh, but first, I wanted to tell you uh, very important stuff. So this 700 unit shortcut. If uh, once again, uh, we would like this Docker image and this uh, Jupyter notebooks to be kind of also a standalone uh, tutorial and standalone documentation for the stuff. And if you run uh, this notebook fresh, like closing everything, resetting and running it fresh, you can just click everything on all cells in this shortcut to get to the final results we now have with this luminosity monitor. Right, just for you to know that if you, because uh, everything we did was kind of uh, uh, smeared in uh, several units and five and actually six. So actually to have everything done and then maybe to study it, you can do this by the 700 shortcut, just for you to know. All right, let's go back to uh, G4E. And I show you one more important thing that we should talk about and uh, I wanted to show you how we organize stuff. So if we go to sources, mine detectors, uh, J-like, and then uh, you see here is the directory with detector construction, right? Uh, so there's one more file called J-like detector config. And if we open it, you see that basically what's happening here it's, uh, it's a struct called uh, JLike Detector Configs with a lot of configs of subdetectors. Let me actually explain you how this works. I can close the Jupyter. We don't need it uh, today anymore. And actually go back to presentation a little bit. So this master config is kind of a, uh, it consists of have all configs of the all subdetectors. And uh, if uh, when uh, detector construction construct method goes, what it actually does, it takes a subdetector config in some uh, particular order, one by one, fill it with the right parameters, submit to subdetector, subdetector builds itself, and it goes back to master, it takes the sec second subconfig. So this master config uh, is kind of a tree with all the configuration which is actually built during the detector construction. Uh, once again, we want to try uh, everything to be very explicit and understandable for Gen 4 experts. 
uh, which means that just going through uh, there, there are some code in this uh, our delay detector construction, but probably when you see, you just see how we apply those configs, how this works. But there's one more thing that might be required for sub detector, and we bring one, one more thing called uh, initialization context. So initialization context has all, and actually uh, we probably will rename it to running context. It has all the global parameters and uh, global actually some classes, initialization classes, that might be also needed to build your sub detector or even master detector. So initialization context context is available for master detector construction and you actually saw it commented out for sub detector because you didn't need it but if needed you can actually use it and it has all information about uh, first for example where is the main root file so if uh, luminosity monitor don't want to create its own root file but actually add uh, maybe some data or put something to the uh, main file, that's how, uh, how, how it's done. So you can use initialization context. So another thing, it has all the user arguments and by arguments, we don't mean only flags, like with the number of threads and uh, something like this, right? But also with output base name, you see that uh, all those files we created have the same base name in the beginning. So, and very important stuff is uh, how you add your, how sub detectors add their event actions, like uh, Lumi has event action and run action. And also this initialization context uh, uh, has ability to add your own event action and run action for your detector. Yes, uh, in this G4E, compared to all run examples, where you usually have just uh, one central uh, action detector action initialization in G4E each sub detector may actually put uh, their own run actions and because of the multi-threading uh, because uh, in multi-threading uh, you have to uh, create your actions for each uh, sub sub thread actually sub worker right we submit not just uh, uh, object, not, not just event actions, and, uh, but we submit some Lambda function which knows how to create our uh, event action or run action, but it's pretty easy, you can see it, examples. So that's actually, I probably would like to also add if we were final improvements made by this, we also would like to add this luminosity monitor config to our master config, you now know what I'm talking about. Let's actually go to answering some common questions about this thing and uh, to proceed to final part of this presentation. So what about multi-threading? Because right now I run everything in a single thread and is there multi-threading? The short answer is yes, uh, G4E supports strength multi-threading. We had uh, times when we turn it off and actually on this week uh, we were re-enabled to turn it on uh, so we can reject everything after we move to re rig beam line that we reject that everything works. But there are some uh, still uh, bugs uh, that we have to fix, but it's pretty already close. So you can try to use multi-threading on your own risk. We not recommend it this week, but we probably will fix it around next week or something like this. So to do so, how you do this, uh, so Python library has this function called threads where you can specify the number of threads or there is a minus T or thread flags, uh, which you can add to the program arguments and it all runs. Once again, we now know two uh, bugs with it. Uh, the everything will run, but uh, the results might be uh, not what you would like. Uh, so, uh, what we will fix at like the end of this week, so tomorrow or maybe the beginning of next week. So, uh, probably it's a good way to say that uh, about the multi threading that we have multi threading and please use it. So, uh, the other thing is that uh, there might be a first impression that uh, what we do, we put everything, all parameters in C code, and actually uh, what you do is uh, you just always recompile and uh, how you can add something without recompilation or change something without recompilation. And the answer to that is actually we're just using the Gen tools. And Gen 4 has this uh, pretty handy generic messenger, 
which allows you to uh, just uh, add any parameter, like for example, we have config, so any parameter and any number of parameters with just one line to uh, be accessible from the uh, Jant4 macros. So now you can change it from Jant4 macros uh, without actually recompilation. And <coughs> Talking about uh, kind of compilation and recompilation times, uh, it's uh, pretty important to say also that all frameworks has, uh, they are all kind of, if you think about it really carefully, they are all the same. And uh, G4E is the same, and other frameworks are the same, and uh, they have something that is compiled because we want performant code to run, right? There's something that interpreted in our case with Python, might be root micros, whatever. So, and uh, they're actually uh, configs also. And uh, indeed, different uh, frameworks have different ratios between them and if you start looking into them there is actually reasons for that so for example for G4E we wanted everything to be once again as close to Jant4 and familiar for Jant4 expert as possible so we just compile everything and we say that if we try to keep recompilation time uh, kind of fast like in less than 10 seconds for uh, recompiling for if several files changes right so it's okay uh, it might be not okay for larger frameworks where compilation uh, take anyway takes like minutes or something, but it actually doesn't matter. Uh, the real question uh, beside this is uh, how you deal with your configuration when you submit your jobs, right? And by configuration, I'm usually means that customized files. So, for example, okay, now you have uh, you change the G4E and you want to run it on some kind of farm or batch job or something, and how you actually uh, do this, how you commit to the farm change stuff, or maybe it's not G4E but some other framework, how you uh, commit the file with configuration, and the answer to this. Uh, actually, they also always answer to this, how you do this, and it lays usually absolutely outside of the framework. But it's good time to actually one more time announce that very soon we'll introduce you to the system, how out of the Jupyter Lab and, uh, and uh, those uh, Jupyter notebooks, you can simply uh, check that this configuration uh, fine for you, and now you want this configuration to run on the farm and actually track its process and then collect the results and probably we will have an announce and then we'll have a tutorial about it. All right, let's go back to the next uh, questions and answers. So first of them, how can I save the data? And uh, if I change, if I go run Docker and do some changes, so first uh, the Docker has uh, uh, Jupyter Lab, so everything is a uh, repository, right? So, and uh, Jupyter Lab has this uh, JIT uh, repository extension. If you please let me go back quickly to Jupyter Lab, here is uh, this Jupyter uh, Lab JIT extension which allows uh, to work out of it. Certainly, they are JIT in uh, this Docker image, right? And uh, probably the most important to say here is that we run for these tutorials for this RM flag. And with this RM flag, after you close the Docker, it actually resets all the changes to the hard drive you made. So everything will be like new. We use it for tutorial, it's convenient for tutorial. But when you start actually uh, hacking stuff and changing stuff, you probably don't need this flag. So the second uh, question actually is uh, how you process your own file. So you have your uh, PFO or whatever file you wanted to process. And uh, the answer for this is uh, by adding uh, is by adding this plug minus V where you can specify bind your folder on your machine to some folder in the Docker and we propose this folder because uh, this folder will be under uh, under this uh, Jupyter environment and you will instantly see it. Uh, but that's pretty easy too, unless you are on Windows, but that's also fixable. So that's how you do this. And uh, finally, uh, kind of the full connection stream. Uh, 
which opens not only this 888 and uh, 6080 port, but also port uh, uh, kind of VNC port so you can connect. And if you will try to debug, actually run GDB on uh, C++ there, you will find that without those flags like cap at trace, something like this, the debugging might be not working because you are in Docker and Docker is try to kind of uh, limit some kernel features for your safety. So you have to put those flags to enable debugging. So if you will try to debugging, so don't forget these flags. So finally, how to install things on my machine? We actually covered this in the tutorial. So uh, right now, uh, the main thing that we support is containers, right? So it's kind of the main tool that we support. But uh, we also, you can also on your own risk, if it's Linux or Mac, try to use the CGPM to install everything on your machine. And finally, I would like to say thank you and say that your uh, inputs is really needed. So we created this framework, we use it ourselves to produce our uh, plots and analysis. But what we really need, what we really need is user input on this. Because what we really want behind all this software initiative is to actually grow with users. Yes, uh, G4E is simple, it's simple uh, Gen4 uh, implementation, but it's simple for a reason. Uh, because we see that for yellow pages, for example, we now need a simple task. And what we would like is that uh, it will grow with user input, grow with you. And here is the channels where you can submit your uh, questions. You, we, we can discuss it on Slack, for example. It's pretty active right now. Uh, so submit your questions, uh, submit your problems, submit your ideas. If you put your detector to G4E, please let us know. We will be glad to commit it to our main branch and to make it default or something like this. So thank you very much. That was the end of these tutorials. If you have any questions, I'm here. We have like six minutes before the next tutorial. Thank you very much for the great tutorial and the great update, um, Dimitri. Um, as Dimitri asked, um, are there any specific questions for him before we turn the microphone to Chris? All right, so I hope there's uh, the question will arise when people try to use it by their own. So once again, here's the links to our uh, to uh, G4E, to eGPM, to our support sites. And yeah, I giving up this. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Um, and uh, let me stop the recording for the first part.